Christ is risen, my friends. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. My dear friends in Christ. The answers could be in the stars. Be on the lookout for new networking opportunities all week. A chance encounter could even lead to a solid romantic relationship. This is an excellent week to publish an artistic project or to seek out representation. You have the ability to craft something of extremely fine quality that also inspires. Even though the creativity is flowing, you still need to buckle down and do the heavy lifting on Wednesday. Tuesday is a good day to create a budget and business plan, especially if you are an inspiring entrepreneur hoping to get your dreams off the ground. Are those the answers you were looking for in life, in your horoscope? I wonder, if Martin Luther had a horoscope, what would it have said? Today might be a good day to nail something to a church door. Okay, so horoscopes are pretty silly, right? The stars do not hold our destinies. You and I know that. And yet so many people read a horoscope. So many people look to that because they're looking for some advantage in life. Something to take away the doubt. Something that gives them certainty. But you and I who put our hope in the Lord know that the stars have nothing to do with our futures. So why does the Lord point us to the stars today? What do the stars have to do with taking away our doubts. Well, Abram had to find that out for himself, too. Abram was starting to doubt God's promises. Earlier, the Lord had promised Abram that he was going to have a child. Abram desperately looked forward to that, especially as the years got on. He was getting older and he didn't have any children. And when we read about Abram today, he had just gotten back from a fierce battle. He had fought some warlords that had taken captive his nephew and his nephew's family and, and Abram and, and his soldiers went and they rescued them. And Abram was, was in his 80s when all this took place. Imagine that. And I'm pretty sure that Abram was a little shaken up by that, wondering that I could have died doing that. And I could have died without having a child. Is the Lord going to keep his promise? How is this going to happen? I'm getting older and, and I'm not getting any younger. And so the Lord initiated a conversation with Abram. He comes to Abram and in a vision, he tells Abram, don't worry, I've got your back, I'm protecting you, and through me, all of these good things are going to happen. But Abram's still at his doubts. He responds to the Lord that, he doesn't think this is going to happen, that, that Lord, you've, you've been keeping me from having children all these years. In fact, Abram literally says, you have stripped me naked. You have removed the ability for me to have children. There's an accusation there, isn't there? Ouch. Imagine if you were a parent and your, your child is accusing you of not caring about you. So Abram figures he's going to have to take care of this on his own. That if he's going to secure his future, he needs to take matters into his own hands. And so his head servant, Eliezer, is going to be the heir to his home. That's how it's going to have to be. Now, the Lord could have been upset with Abram here. But instead, he responds with patience, with gentle assurance. He tells Abram, no. That's not how it's going to happen. I'm keeping my promise. And he doesn't just tell Abram, just wait and see, and, and, and you'll see how I do it. He tells Abram exactly how he's going to do it. You're going to have a child who comes from your own body, your own flesh and blood. And he takes Abram by the hand, takes him outside, and tells him, look at the stars. Look at those stars. That's how big your family is going to be. You see, God could have been upset with Abram, angry even that, that he had refused to believe the promise, especially after the Lord had just kept him safe in that battle to rescue his nephew. But he wasn't. He understood 
the weakness and the, the, the frailty of faith. And so in gentleness, in patience, he brings Abram back to the promise, points him to the stars, gives him something he can see and hold on to so he can believe. Well, let's think about our own life. I mean, certainly none of us, I don't think, have ever been given such a tremendous promise like Abram, that, that for our, most of our lives we're going to be childless, and, and then right at the end the Lord's going to give us a child. I don't think any of us have ever had to hope on that kind of a promise. But we do have our own doubts, don't we? Our lives are, are filled up sometimes with uncertainty and worries. We, we look at our families and, and we wonder what's going to happen to them. We, we think about the people we love in our lives and, and we're concerned for them, the decisions they make. <clears throat> we think about our own lives, our health concerns, financial concerns. What's my future supposed to be like? What, what choices, what, what goals am I supposed to have in my life? We look out into the world and, and we see all that's going on and, and we wonder what's going to happen next. And, and how are we supposed to live in a, a world that seems to be spiraling out of control and, and filled with more war and more violence and, and more immorality and, and more indecision? We look at a generation coming up that, that might be the most selfless generation ever. And we wonder to ourselves, how are we going to do it all? And those promises that God has made sometimes seem so distant, so uncertain, so pointless. And that's when doubt starts to come in. We start to wonder how God could possibly keep those promises. We start to, to wonder if the promises mean anything anymore, if, if maybe it's outdated and, and, and it doesn't apply to my life anymore. Or sometimes we, we try to figure out how we're going to do this on our own, kind of like Abram did here, that, that maybe I'll, I'll figure out a way to, to make it work out the right way, the way it's supposed to be, the way God is supposed to be directing things, and, and he seems to have forgotten or neglected. You know, I think one of the things that, that causes us the most uncertainty is, is we just don't know what's going to happen, right? We, boy, if only I knew what was going to happen next week. But did you ever think... For the people in the Bible that, that God did reveal the future to, did that ever help them? I think in some cases it probably did, but I'm thinking of the disciples, where Jesus told them on multiple occasions, the Son of Man is going to go to Jerusalem, he's going to be arrested, he's going to be put on trial, he's going to be put to death, and on the third day he's going to rise again. And how many of them accepted that as the truth and the reality that it was going to be? If you know the story of the Passion in any way, you know that they didn't believe that even when they knew that Jesus was the Son of God, even when they knew the future, they were still filled with fear and anxiety. Even Peter thought he could redirect the course of human events so that, that it would go better for Jesus. No, Lord, you're not going to go to Jerusalem. You're not going to die. And aren't we the same way? We try to direct the events of our lives, take it out of God's control, and do it ourselves. And when we see that that, that doesn't help, that, that we wind up in the same spot of, of doubt and fear and anxiety and worry, then those promises seem even less applicable. And sometimes we get so filled up with worry and fear that we're just going to turn our backs on the whole thing. Forget the promises, forget God, just bury our heads in our own lives and carry on. Now God could be angry with us about that. He could come to us and condemn us for that. And he would be just in doing that. For turning our backs on him like that. But we look at how he deals with Abram here. Or we look at how Jesus dealt with doubting Thomas, Didymus. And we see how he deals with us too. He understands how sensitive faith is. He understands how weak we can be. He understands how we can so easily be filled with uncertainty. And so what does he do? He takes us by the hand and he shows us his promises again. Because God knows that the only answer to the doubts we have in our lives are his promises. So he takes us and he says, look at my word. 
Look at what I've done for you. Look at all the promises I've made and look how I sent a Savior for you to keep those promises and to, to fulfill them. A Savior who came and, and lived for you, who died for you, who rose again for you. He takes us by the hand and he leads us to the table where in bread and wine he says to us, come and participate with me and, and be one with me. Have union with me so that you can know that these promises are true. He says, look, I take this water and watch how I wash this child's sins away and make them a member of my family forever. Remember your own baptisms too. It's like God taking us by the hand, leading us outside and, and pointing us to the stars and saying, look, look at my promises. Look at what I've done for you. Now believe. It's really the same thing Jesus did for, for Didymus, isn't it? Put your hand here. Put your finger here. Something he could see, something he could touch, something he could hold on to. God does the same thing for us as he points us back to his word. And, and not just word, but to water. And, and not just water, but bread and wine. So that we can see and hear and touch and hold and know the promises that God has made. That we can look at the stars and remember his words. The key for us is that we have to seek those promises out. Sort of like Abraham here, as he speaks to the Lord and, and he just opens his heart and, he, and he's basically saying, Lord, I, I don't know how I'm supposed to believe this. I don't know how, because here's what I see and it doesn't make any sense to me. I'm filled with worry. I'm filled with uncertainty. I, I'm even filled with some accusations and anger against you. But he brought that to the Lord. And when we do that, when we come to the Lord with all of our worry and anxiety and doubt and fear and uncertainty, the Lord can bring us back to his promises. And when we listen to those promises, when we look at the stars and we see what he's done for us, then God can take that doubt away. Because it's those promises that give us everything we need, every good thing from God. When Abram looked at those stars, it says he believed the Lord, and he, God, credited it to him as righteousness. Literally, it was caused to be considered righteous. In other words, God had won Abraham over. He had laid his promises out before him, and in gentleness and in patience, he had pulled Abraham back from the brink of unbelief and doubt and despair and through the joy and, and gentleness of that promise had given him faith. And Abram believed. And because Abram believed, God forgave his sins. God counted him as righteous. He, he considered him perfect because of his faith. And because he believed in the Lord. And all of those promises that, that Abram looked forward to, took that doubt away, and he was saved. And God works the same way with you and I. When Abram looked at those stars, he was looking ahead to a time when those promises would be fulfilled. He was looking ahead to a Savior who would come. And you and I, we look back at that same Savior, that same Jesus who came, who lived for us, who, who died in our place and paid the price for sin, who rose again to show that, that death had no power over us and that hell had no, nothing to wait for us, we're saved. And that inspires trust in our hearts. It, it's sort of like when we have those trusting relationships in our lives, whether it's a, a spouse to another spouse or a child to a parent or an adult to another trusting adult. When you have that kind of trusting relationship, there's safety there, isn't there? There's, there's re, you can relax. You can live because you know you've got somebody there with you who's going to take care of you, who's got your back. Abram learned that again from the Lord as, as he looked at those stars and, and was transported ahead in time to, to a time when he could see a Savior come and live and die for him too. And another great thing is when Abram looked at those stars, he was looking ahead to this wonderful time when his family would be so great. And guess what? He was looking at you and me. 
Because as Abram looked at those stars, he was looking ahead to a time when people would put their faith in the promises of God. People like you and me who, who hold on to that same promise. And that makes us part of Abram's family. That makes us one of those stars that was a fulfillment of all of the promises that God was making as you and I stand shoulder to shoulder with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all of those Old Testament believers who also place their hope in the Lord. We receive those same blessings. And those are the blessings that take doubt away. Those are the, the blessings that, that remind us that we're right with God. That our futures are secure, that our presents are, are on a sure and certain foundation of God's work, not our work. You know, the doubts that we have, whether it's doubts for our future, we don't have to worry about because God's got our future under control, doesn't he? And, and the concerns that we may have about our present and, and our circumstances, the Lord knows that too. And he has that promise of a savior to rescue us from our sin and guilt and shame so we can face those challenges with sure confidence that nothing can take God's love away from us. As we look at the stars, and we remember those promises. So the answer to life really is in the stars. Not, not the worthless stars like in a horoscope, but the same stars that Abram looked at. The stars that, that looked ahead to a Savior who would live and die and rise again. The, the stars that pointed to a promise. The promise that takes away our doubts and fears and, and delivers to us all the blessings of God. So the answer to doubt really is in the stars. The stars of God's promise. Amen. Amen.